Okay, ladies and gentlemen, if you could take your seats, we'll resume. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for joining us again this afternoon. I hope you enjoyed the morning and you enjoyed your lunch. Um, we heard many different perspectives this morning ac across our sessions from the ministers and the directors general and others. And this afternoon, we are going to go into a more discursive mode where we take some of the themes that, that, that uh, were raised this morning and we discuss them among our panelists, but also amongst yourselves. So this will be a chance to get more interactive in the two discussion panels we're having this afternoon. And of course, we have a couple of very special speakers for you as well during the afternoon. So this first panel uh, we've entitled Evolution of Technology and Policy. And we have some great uh, discursions for you, which I'll introduce in just a second. Just by way of involvement, let me say a couple of things. First of all, hopefully many of you have access to the uh, conference app. Uh, if not, it's not too late to download it, and the instructions are somewhere. Um, and during the course of this morning, we've been running some polls, which many of you have been voting on, so thank you very much for that. Uh, two that I think are worth mentioning for the conversation we're about to have here. One poll that we ran this morning was, what do you think is the biggest barrier to scaling up energy efficiency in your country? And the, an the winning answer at 35% of responses was lack of supporting policy environment. Mm. So I think that's uh, a theme we might uh, pick up as well. A second poll that we ran uh, uh, during the course of the morning uh, asked the question, what technological change will have the greatest impact on energy efficiency? And the leader at the moment, well, joint first, interestingly, is motor vehicle electrification and the digitalization of energy. So they are the two technologies focused uh, on most. So we'll be running a couple of more polls during the afternoon. If you have the app, uh, your phone will buzz. Uh, if not, as I say, please do download it. We sent you all a link to it, or my colleagues can help you get connected. We're also using Twitter, so our hashtag is hash energy efficient world, and I know a lot of you have been joining the conversation there. And during this conversation in the afternoon, we will be taking questions from the floor, but as you can appreciate, time will be tight and, and we won't be able to get to all of you. So first of all, my apologies in advance if I can't squeeze you in. But secondly, a little hint is that I'll be giving a degree of priority to questions that come in on Twitter. So if you want to improve your chances of your question being tabled and answered by our illustrious panel, tweet it with the hashtag Energy Efficient World, and I'll be keeping an eye on that, and uh, we'll include that conversation. And of course, that includes uh, the people who are watching us on the live stream. This is your chance to uh, intervene from wherever you are in the world and ask a question or make a point to our panel. So this panel is about evolution of technology and policy, so we have a mixture of public and private actors. Some are focused more on policy, some on technology, all, I think, to a certain degree on both. It's the nature of the, the world we work in. So what I've asked the panelists to do is make very short opening statements that really introduce themselves, tell us a little bit about their work, and maybe make one or two points that then we can then fold into the conversation. So we'll take the five opening statements, and then we'll broaden out the discussion based on what we've heard, if that's OK. So, our first panelist uh, comes from Canada. Kaylee Levesque is the Senior Director of the Office of Energy Efficiency in Canada, working in the field for many years. And indeed, as you'll hear in a minute, Canada is going through a very dynamic phase for energy policy generally, but also for energy efficiency in particular. So Kaylee, we're very pleased you came to join us. And let's hear from you, please. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you, Brian, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, for those of you who don't know, the Office of Energy Efficiency is part of Natural Resources Canada, so we don't have an energy department per se, but we're part of our Natural Resources Department. Uh, we deal with all areas of energy efficiency, buildings, housing, transportation, industry, and even government operations, the greening of our government operations. Last night, Brian hosted a very uh, innovative approach to launching the conference with a debate on whether uh, the future of energy efficiency uh, really was about technology, policy, or the people. Um, at the Office of Energy Efficiency, we really try to take an, um, build a model that assumes all three are integral to our success. Our policies don't operate in a vacuum, nor do technologies developed in a garage with no receptor capacity have the ability to change the world either. So um, the model we've developed at the OEE is really about partnerships, much like the nature of this event. Um, successful initiatives in this area are those that put, ultimately put the user at the heart of them and bring together the myriad players to develop a vision and achieve common efficiency goals. 
Uh, as Brian alluded to, we are at a turning point in Canada. It's exciting uh, and busy <laughs> in terms of both climate and energy efficiency policy. There's been uh, several large public international and domestic uh, commitments uh, on the environmental, energy, and technological fronts, and now we're translating all of these commitments into policy and program goals. The imperative to action is clear. We've signed on to the Paris Agreement. We helped launch Mission Innovation, and just recently uh, we announced that we will be hosting the 10th Clean Energy Ministerial in Canada in 2019. Domestically, we've been focused on the development and now the implementation of our pan-Canadian framework on clean growth and climate change, our PCF, which is our plan to address climate change and also advance economic growth. Technology features largely in this policy framework to help Canadians use energy more efficiently at home, at work, and on the road, and an increasing portion of this energy will come from clean and renewable sources. Uh, knowing that my time is nearly up, I want to talk a little bit about how the implementation of the PCF really will re require the development of new and flexible models and strategies to mobilize all levels of government. Uh, energy is a shared jurisdiction in Canada, so we work with our provinces, territories, as well as the federal government. Um, and this really requires us to harness the full potential of the digital model. It's not just, when I say digital model, it's not just about the technological tools themselves, but it's, it's about how we make policy in the digital era. Frankly, it's exhilarating and a little bit messy. Um, and we are making every effort to be user-centric, to be open and network, and to prototype and test interventions before going full-blown down any approach. Um, the Pan-Canadian framework will be done in partnership with provinces and territories, so we'll be able to test different models and see what works in one region to meet local needs might not work in another area. Um, where technologies are more advanced in certain jurisdictions, then we can focus on different areas. Um, and we're also launching some other innovative solutions to uh, help tackle these challenges, such as our Impact Canada Fund, which will focus on technology and clean growth. Um, and finally, I would just like to invite you all uh, to visit our dialogue. We have an online dialogue called Generation Energy, which is an online dialogue that our minister launched recently, aimed at getting as many points of view as possible, including those from around the world, on Canada's energy future. So what do energy pathways look like post-2050? What does energy policy even look like as we come past the Paris Agreement? I look forward to a, a dynamic and engaging conversation with my panelists uh, about how we make policy in a constantly evolving technological landscape. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, a quick question for you before we go to our next panelist. You, you spoke about um, uh, this turning point. You started by using the phrase turning point. What has driven that turning point? Why, is, uh, why has Canada decided to put this new focus now? Thank you. Um, so I think in Canada, the turning point is several things coming to a head at once. Uh, we had a significant transition in government. Uh, you, you, may have, you may remember uh, hearing clear statements, Canada is back on the international stage. Those comments were made loud and clear uh, as we headed into the Paris, the COP negotiations. Um, there's been that. There's also been a transition in the approach we take to federalism in Canada, where it's really about a more dynamic partnership. Um, but it's also because technology is coming to it. There is a a lot of disruptive technologies that are coming to a breaking point in Canada where they are really, the, the, the evolution is so rapid that there needs to be a different model. It's clear the old tools aren't doing it, and so we're, we're adapting in real time. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank Katie. you. Thank you. Um, let's hear from our second speaker now, who is to my right, Jim. Jim Hanna uh, hails from the same continent as Kayleigh, but a slightly different part, and he's the Director of Data Centre Sustainability for Microsoft. So Jim, you're very welcome, and, and let's hear from you. Sure, a slightly different part in a very different world from Canada, it seems, at the moment. Um, so I'll keep my prepared remarks brief, but at, at Microsoft, we really believe that cloud computing and the opportunities of connected devices and artificial intelligence and greater broadband connectivity for the globe's, global citizens really represent what we call the world's fourth industrial revolution. And we all know the first three industrial revolutions, I won't go over those, but I think we understand that if, if frankly, we have the hubris to declare that we're in the midst of a revolution, it's our responsibility to ensure that we look back upon this moment in our lives and ensure that the energy and the water and the land and the materials that we used and have used to build this infrastructure really leaves a legacy of, for all the people of the world that are better off because of the work we've done. So that's driving our force around our construction and our development of this built infrastructure called the cloud. 
So I will briefly touch on two opportunities before we get to the questions uh, in my opening. But first is the opportunity with, with efficiency within this physical infrastructure, the cloud itself, the data centers that really provide the backbone for the explosive growth in technology globally. Previous studies, frankly, painted a bleak picture around estimated the growth of data centers would begin to largely eat into the national grids of countries around the world at, at a breakneck pace. But fortunately, what we've seen in recent data indicates that despite the continued absolute growth of the data center world, our industry's focus on transitioning business and government and individual customers from their existing legacy infrastructure to services in the cloud that utilize much more efficient technologies and a much more efficient built environment have really flattened that growth curve to now we continue to consume right around 2% of the global energy grid um, over the last several years. So that growth trajectory has really flattened out, which is good for our industry and a great indication of the efficiency that our industry has made into, into the space of cloud computing. Second, I want to talk about uh, the use of internet connected devices or IoT and, and most importantly, the analytical tools that process the massive massive amounts of data generated by these IoT devices around the world um, and really represent, in my opinion, and I think in a lot of our opinions, the, the single largest opportunity to drive efficiency into the existing infrastructure of the built environment of our growing cities and infrastructures and the industrial and agricultural processes around the world and frankly, in individual lives themselves. So I was struck by our comments from our, our friend from Ireland when you mentioned uh, the focus on the connection between efficiency, technology, and human health. Um, these are the opportunities where technology really presents itself in people's lives, and those opportunities, I believe, are boundless. I'm not talking about the opportunity to share videos of cats more efficiently across social media. No knock on my friends at Facebook, but I'm really talking about deploying connected technologies and analytics to make brilliant buildings, not just smart buildings to give farmers real-time visibility to the needs of individual plants so that they can tailor their watering and their fertilizing in a very effective way, to pinpoint spread of diseases like Zika in communities using traps that instantly analyze the DNA of mosquitoes entering those traps and provide that information in real time up to, up to ministries of health so that they can control these disease vectors very quickly and very effectively. These are the opportunities that IoT provides our sector and provides the world and frankly our ability to deploy this technology is critical to efficiency around the world. The beauty of this technology revolution is that it's also creating entirely new business models for, for companies like mine, who are large legacy companies, but also for startup entrepreneurs globally who really have the opportunity to flourish in this space of IoT. But smart policy is critical to ensuring that this innovation is fostered instead of stifled. In the example of renewable energy, we often experience policy conditions that are detrimental to growth in spite of government's commitments for meeting aggressive renewable targets. For instance, in the U.S., uh, where I reside, over 90% of renewable energy deals are done in deregulated markets. 90%. While we're not advocating wholesale deregulation of the energy markets, there's certainly room to work together to solve this discontinuity uh, and really focus on policy as a driver for efficiency and policy as a driver for innovation. Conversely, it's been mentioned that policies such as those requiring minimum efficiency levels in vehicles, buildings, and appliances have been hugely effective in accelerating this transition from, to an efficient legacy infrastructure, to new products that people want to own, new products that people are excited about, not just because they're energy efficient, because, but because they're cool, and homes that keep them as healthy as, as we can. So Microsoft really looks forward to working with the IEA and its members to drive smart policies will, frankly, in my opinion, unleash the technology innovation we're capable of producing. Thank you for inviting us to this industry forum, and we look forward to the conversation. Thank you very much. Um, not that there's anything wrong with uh, yes, a round of applause. That, that was for your point about cats and the internet, that <laughs> small round of applause. Um, we'll come back to the whole thing about opportunities in a couple of minutes, but sure. just on your first point around data centers, you build data centers all, all around the world. They're becoming much more efficient because you want to spend less on electricity and Absolutely. energy generally. Does policy matter? Does it matter what the policy environment is that you're working in? It, it's, it's really interesting because we believe that that in order for us to continue on the growth curve that we're on in the data center space, that it's critical that the grid that we rely on is reliable. And it's critical that the grid that we are utilizing around the world meets our demands around renewable energy opportunities, around consistency, and around reliability. So yes, policy is absolutely critical in that space. I mean, frankly, we're going to invest in efficiency as, as an industry because it makes absolute business sense to do that. And we're going to continue to do that because it reduces the costs and makes us more competitive against our competitors. But the promise that we make our customers, we call it five nines, but the promise we make our customers that if your business is in the cloud or your government is in the cloud, that 99.99% .99 of the time that cloud will be up and running. 
that is imperative on a reliable grid to make sure that that's happening. Okay, thank you very much. Let's go to our third speaker now and we'll be bringing everyone back in a few minutes. Uh, we heard this morning from India about the great work that's going on and particularly the heroic program on LED lighting, which I think is the largest in the world. And we are joined by the hero behind that heroic program, uh, Sarab Kumar, who's a good friend of ours and a good friend of the IEA and a good friend of energy efficiency globally. So, Sarab, thanks for joining us. Please uh, tell us your thoughts. Thanks, Brian. I mean, it's, it's, uh, uh, thanks for the compliment. But yeah, it's, it's a team that works. Uh, obviously, the leader gets the, the... But anyway, thank you very much for inviting us. Just a brief introduction. We are a public sector company. Uh, the the uh, a public sector ESCO in India, perhaps the largest such ESCO anywhere in the world in terms of operations, in terms of investments, in terms of scale, uh, largely driven by the fact that India is a very large country and it's, it's quite easy to, to reach that scale. Essentially what, what has worked for us is, is, a, is a business model that has incentives for perhaps all kinds of uh, stakeholders, that is one. Number two, has no subsidy no rate payer uh, rebates from the regulators, no grants from anyone. It is a self-sustaining model which is flexible, which has incentives for everyone because uh, uh, for, for, for a user, whether it is a municipal body or a, or a consumer, if they use energy efficiency, uh, energy efficient equipments or services, they end up uh, uh, gaining a lot of, uh, I mean, uh, reducing their cost. And therefore, it has, the energy efficiency has a uh, inherent political capital that we have been able to capture uh, very well and because uh, 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 an elected government doesn't need to allocate funds to, to do a program, for example, replacement of all street lights or providing bulbs to, to, uh, to households. They don't have to do anything. It's, it's, it's just a pay-as-you-save model. And therefore, we have been able to scale this up very, uh, very much. We have been flexible and therefore the first cost has not bothered us uh, in, in the last two and a half years. When we, we did this program of LED bulbs when, and we bought bulbs at five dollars and we were still uh, doing that. Yes, we entered into 10-year contracts with utilities and, and we are still uh, getting uh, paid. Today because of the scale, the cost, the bulk procurement cost of LEDs have got down to 65 cents and we are still doing this program. Obviously now the paybacks have come down to a few months rather than 10 years. So, that is the flexibility that we have shown in our model, which has, been, which has enabled us to scale up. Yesterday, the poll, and I completely agree with the, with the general sentiment that it is neither technology nor policy, it is people. And that is what we have shown in our program, because we have addressed directly the people by a variety of ways. We have a mobile app which, which connects directly to people. We did a campaign called I Led The Way, where we asked people to pledge. And we got almost six to seven million pledges on our website that we will use only LED lighting. So we reached out to the consumers directly. Also, the distribution points that we have for LED bulbs are also, also uh, very near to the consumers. And just to give you numbers, some of them were also told in the, in the morning. We have distributed in just over two years 245 million LED bulbs to almost 80 million households in the country. Uh, we have replaced 2.6 million street lights with LED street lights without any municipal body investing any uh, money upfront. We are, we, are, we are getting paid in seven years from, the, from these uh, things. And also we have recently started uh, fans and tube lights. Uh, that has also picked up fairly well. And just to add that we have exported this model outside India. We have started this program in the UK and we are actually looking to build up uh, in, in other countries as well. And as far as the topic is concerned, if I may uh, just add a line, I feel technology will always come if there is a right policy and a market demand. And we have shown this A in LED bulbs. When we started the program, the LED bulbs were actually not present in India, not much prevalent in the world. Today, it is the fastest growing market in the world. We are driving 12% of the demand. The innovation has come up. The efficiencies of LEDs have gone up. Secondly, very recently, we procured air conditioners. We procured air conditioners that were not available in the Indian market in terms of efficiency, and we got it because, because we showed a market. So I am a firm believer if you have the right policy environment, which India has, and if you, if you, if you aggregate demand or you create a market, technology will follow. Thank you. So, but about that starting point, so in the time it took you to make your remarks, you probably sold about 500 bulbs uh, <laughs> remotely. Slightly and, more. Uh, <laughs> but 
235 million plus 500 must be easier than zero plus 500. So tell us about the first 500 bulbs in terms of when nobody knew what this was, when no one knew the model. How did you build the trust and the consumer engagement to, to get it started? Well, uh, the first, uh, uh, I mean, we, we took a calculated gamble by getting into a 10-year contract with the utility. Now, obviously, the bulbs will not last for 10 years. And there is obviously a, a fair chance of our investments uh, getting. But it was important to demonstrate that A, we have the capacity to do this program, B, to the consumers that it makes a lot of sense in terms of their energy bill, and C, as I said, we leverage the political capital. And again, what happened was, in that state, the, the politicians put their photographs on the, on the, on the bulb packet because it's going to 200,000 houses. So that's a, that's a big message going. And that all the combination of these three saw the orders jumping from 600,000 to nearly one point, uh, sorry, 18 million in a matter of three months. And, and then the, the, it just spread and like wildfire. So we took that gamble, and we, we, we uh, are not at all unhappy about it. I'm picturing every energy label on an appliance with a picture of a minister on it. That's, uh, that's my idea. Okay. Um, if you haven't heard of the brand name Artelic, you've certainly heard of the name Beko, one of the big uh, uh, consumer appliance manufacturers in the world, uh, very focused on energy efficiency, both in its manufacturing, but also in the appliances it produces, as well as in its wider environment. So we're fortunate to be joined by Fatih Oskadi, who's the Sustainability and Corporate Affairs Director. Fatih, you're very welcome. Thank you, Brian. Uh, the first of all, I would like to thank you for a uh, very good uh, the introduction uh, for uh, our company. The, my company, actually, is um, the founded in uh, 1955 as a subsidiary of the Coach Holding. The Coach Holding is the Turkey's uh, largest industrial conglomerate. And uh, today, uh, my company, actually, is the worldwide producer and the marketer uh, of the consumer durables and the consumer electronics. Uh, with uh, 30,000 uh, employees um, and uh, the uh, 18 uh, manufacturing facilities in uh, Turkey, Romania, South Africa, Russia, China, and Thailand, and Pakistan. The 19th one uh, will be erected in uh, India uh, in the coming soon. Uh, my company uh, operates uh, roughly the 150 countries uh, and manages uh, 11 um, separate um, uh, core brands and uh, the uh, 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 34 uh, the sales and marketing uh, offices. The uh, energy efficiency uh, is extremely important for our uh, companies, uh, the business uh, uh, model. Uh, the uh, Bico, as you said, uh, the, uh, our uh, global uh, brand um, uh, has been uh, the market leader in the UK and uh, we have been um, uh, marketing uh, the uh, energy efficient uh, appliances uh, in uh, all uh, Europe and all other uh, the developing countries for uh, the several uh, years. And uh, we uh, captured the leading uh, the brand position in uh, the uh, free standing uh, total uh, Europe uh, at, the, at the moment. Uh, Archilic uh, is uh, the only the Turkish entity uh, in the list of the 500 companies uh, published by the World Intellectual Property Organization, the WIPO, and it has achieved the highest uh, ranking uh, the date uh, up to now, it's, which is very important for uh, the, uh, to show the uh, power of the R&D, uh, because you know the R&D is uh, uh, extremely important uh, for uh, the, uh, extending uh, the energy efficiency in uh, products and uh, the uh, production. Um, we uh, recorded a uh, consolidated turnover is roughly the 5 billion uh, euro uh, in uh, uh, 2016 and uh, the uh, majority of uh, the energy efficient appliances is uh, the roughly the 80-85% uh, in uh, the, the manner of the, uh, this uh, turnover and so the uh, energy efficiency uh, for the appliances and the, the, the production um, you know, is uh, very important for uh, uh, the, uh, uh, to get the higher uh, the, uh, 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 turnover. And, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, Jim was talking about the, all the opportunities that are opening up from digital technology and smart and connectivity. That must be affecting your world. I presume the kind of you know, smart, connected kind of devices is coming into some of your technologies. Yeah. 
uh, in, in the near future, uh, the, uh, the, the connected and the uh, smart appliances uh, 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 will be uh, very widened uh, in all over the world. Uh, and uh, the uh, connection uh, uh, among uh, the appliances um, uh, will give us uh, the, uh, very good opportunities uh, for uh, the uh, 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 best uh, the energy efficiency uh, and uh, uh, which will result in the combating the uh, climate change uh, and uh, I believe that this will uh, be very helpful uh, for the Europe's the, uh, 2000, 2030 uh, uh, targets uh, 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 and uh, the uh, 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 connected uh, appliances um, uh, also, the, the, to, to produce uh, the connected appliances in the, the uh, production uh, will be very important uh, uh, by using the uh, 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 lowest uh, energy consumption in the, the production. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Now let's go to our, our fifth panelist. A couple of weeks ago, I was in Beijing for the Clean Energy Ministerial, and Governor Jerry Brown of California was there, and somebody asked him, what's the secret of California's success? And he said two things, very strong policy and hiring very smart people. Mm -hmm. And this is the man he was referring to in that second point, uh, Andrew McAllister, who has actually just been reappointed for his second term of uh, commissioner at the California Energy Commission. Andrew, you're very welcome. Thank you very much. <clears throat> it's a real pleasure to be here, uh, as, as particularly as the third North American country on this panel. Um, Wait, wait for it. Anyway, um, so, <laughs> um, but uh, I really have five points. I'll try to make them very quickly. So, so for those of you who don't know, the California Energy Commission, we're the state's primary energy policy and planning agency. So we've been around for 42 years now, um, and we do a lot of the things that that we've been talking about uh, today. Um, I oversee energy efficiency policy in the state, obviously, and that's why this uh, gathering is of immense interest to me. Um, climate is still driving California's energy policy regime. Okay, we actually believe that it's happening, and, and um, you know, as all of you do. Um, and if we Count the molecules uh, that you can you, you can follow that to a lot of places, um, and and it's a, kind of a rude awakening when you really follow that down to where we need to be in 2050. So we already have essentially no coal in California, um, and we have to get away from natural gas over time. So uh, narrowing narrowing its use at the margin and eventually eliminating it pretty much altogether. Um, we had a moment May 13th in the afternoon where we had about 90 percent. Uh, okay, we're a state of 40 million people. We're about the fifth or sixth largest economy in the world. Okay, it's a big, a big economy. We had a moment where we were 90% carbon free. And I have no doubt that we're going to be at 100% for some number of hours. That same day, May 13th, we were 60% for the entire day, renewables. Um, so we're getting there. You know, it's a new world. Um, and, and renewables are the least cost uh, supply if, if, we're, you know, if we take demand side resources off the table just for a second. Um, and, and so the future is really here now. And the reason, I get, the reason I'm talking about renewables is because I want to make a couple of points about how energy efficiency needs to evolve. Uh, so I'm here today, California is here today because uh, collective engagement is more important than ever, not less. And EE energy efficiency is and, and will be central to California's and the world's low carbon clean energy future. Um, and energy efficiency makes the renewable goals that we have simpler. Uh, we have a few policies in place in California, which I'm happy to talk about later. Um, the loading order, someone mentioned that um, before, but that's putting efficiency and demand response together at the top of the resource priority list. Um, decoupling, which uh, some of you may be familiar with, which is the utilities uh, business model not being about selling more energy, decoupling energy sales from profit. Uh, and for a long time, we've been doing appliance efficiency standards uh, and energy building standards. Um, that's kind of the, uh, the Energy Commission's bread and butter. Um, let's, so, uh, and we spend about two billion dollars per year uh, on energy efficiency investments in the state, as uh, of largely of ratepayer money, but also some state money. Um, that includes about two hundred million dollars in energy-related R and D, which is um, mostly about energy efficiency. 
And all these efforts are saving our economy tens of billions of dollars every single year already. And we've measured that and we know it. Um, so the, the, the existing buildings, I think, is the, the hardest thing to do. And I have a high level of interest in coordinating and collaborating with all of you about how to get at our existing buildings. I think that's really the problem of the day. We have an existing building energy efficiency action plan in California, which I would commend folks to look at if you're interested. Um, and you know, lots of reasons why our existing buildings have to be front and center. Most of those buildings are already here, and we, if we don't go through those buildings to clean them up and get them uh, highly performing, then we're not going to reach our climate and energy goals. And so we have to solve this problem. And by the way, we need the headroom that efficiency is going to uh, generate in order to make room for all these electric vehicles that are coming. And in California, they are coming. Um, so I want to reiterate the people are at the center of success message. Um, I think uh, this really is about getting people uh, to choose voluntarily, mostly. We, we're all for good, strong regulations. Um, but the products that people buy are the ones that delight them and the ones that excite them. Uh, and energy performance, energy aspects of those products is only a minority of the characteristics that they're actually choosing. And so I think we have to really look at this much more broadly. All of us are energy wonks. Uh, I certainly am. But uh, I think we need to think more like uh, sort of uh, normal people, no criticism intended. Um, so the last point, um, last two points I want to make are just are very related. So we have to recognize that efficiency has to adapt in this brave new world of diverse and distributed energy. Uh, automation is key. And to manage energy systems in this new reality, data is key. Okay, we have to have the energy infrastructure and the, and the informational infrastructure. Uh, we have to invest in that in order to get to where we need to go. So I'm working really hard on this, uh, on this putting together the platform for this new energy economy in California. And uh, I'm hearing that, that many of you are as well. And I'm, I'm excited to build a broad international collaboration and, and possibly even figure out how to standardize some of that. So I think uh, that would really help us lower transaction costs and get where we need to go. Uh, if we don't leverage demand response, and energy efficiency and demand response are, are becoming one and the same. Energy efficiency, some, there, are, there are moments where a saved kilowatt hour has negative value. Okay? If there is an abundance of efficiency, we want to use, abundance of renewables, we want to use that energy. So I think there are also moments where energy efficiency has extremely high value. So locational and temporal aspects we have to learn how to grapple with basically in real time. So if efficiency is going to meet its goals, uh, is going to help us meet our goals, uh, we really have to um, evolve in, that, in this, um, you know, I think digitization is a good word for some of this, uh, but really it's about uh, advanced and real time management of energy demand. Um, so there are equity applications of this. This is my last point. Um, you know, if we, if we don't do this, uh, that, that sort of smart management approach, we're going to end up over-investing in our distribution grid. We're going to end up putting batteries everywhere. We're going to end up uh, buying a lot of hardware uh, that isn't necessary. And so I think there are major equity implications of that if we, if we don't invest wisely and properly in the near term. Um, and also related to equity is uh, you know, low-income solutions. We have uh, a lot of multifamily buildings with low income and um, workforce, getting the workforce engaged. So those have been mentioned before. I just wanted to also say that they're important to us. We have about a half a million jobs in California that are related to energy, and 400,000 of those are in energy efficiency and about 100,000 in renewables. Efficiency is where the jobs are. So. Um, we're working to sort of weave those equity uh, issues throughout our policy regime. So, so California sees efficiency as enlightened self-interest, and uh, it helps us live better in myriad ways, which we can talk about. Um, you know, certainly California, the t tenor in California is is one of uh, indignance at the moment about it, where our federal government has gone, uh, but it's salved by a strong sense of volunteerism, and so I want to just uh, commend. The, the IEA for convening this, and I'm really looking forward to keeping involved. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, would you mind turning off the, the microphone? We'll bring it back in a sec. Thanks, Andrew. Um, 
So efficiency is where the jobs are, but politicians, even people generally, you talk about clean energy, they picture the wind turbine, the solar panel. Efficiency is a harder sell. How do you, how do you, how do you garner interest at, among the political level or even among the general population? Um, so it, it's hard. I mean, uh, you know, there definitely is a desire for ribbon cutting among the political class, and that is not where this problem is going to get solved. The problem is going to get solved with contractors across the kitchen table, across the boardroom, selling jobs and going out there and installing jobs. So I believe that um, you know, it's not just about, certainly not just about the national level or even the state level. It's a lot of this is about uh, local and regional efforts. Um, the local governments, for example, at least in the U.S. and uh, I think most of the world, they're the ones who you have to go to for a building permit. So if they're not engaged and fully committed to enforcing an aggressive building code, then it's not going to happen. Uh, so it really is building um, kind of a, it's almost like a culture change where you really have to build this understanding that the value chain goes all the way down to the individual product, but comes all the way up to the, to the, the, the overall policy regime. We have uh, some very enlightened local governments and some regions in California that are doing great work here, but it's very spotty. And so we have to figure out how to, how to um, make those shifts uh, universal. Uh, we're getting some tweets in, including, I kid you not, a picture of some cats, but uh, <laughs> we'll come back to that later. Um, let's go to the floor. And if you're, se if you're, just put your hand up if you're seated at a, a table with a mic, that'll work for you. And if you're in a row without a mic, some of our colleagues will, will bring you one. So who'd like to ask a question of our panel? You can be the first person to ask a question from the floor at the 2017 Global Energy Efficiency Conference. That's, that's quite a prize. Yep. We're not hearing that mic, sorry. There. We're, we're discussing the link between technology and policy. And the people dimension. Is it working? Yes. Yes. Um, so from... Lorenzo Pagliano from uh, Politecnico di Milano. I, I would like to address a question to um, the California Energy Commission for more details on your decoupling profit from sales, which to me is a very important item, which would be interesting to learn more uh, for the current revision of the Energy Efficiency Directive in Europe. So, just very high level, um, uh, it, it there, it turned rate making into two phases. In the first phase, uh, you sort of figure out what the rate base is, how much the utility owns. And I'm really just talking about, um, for the most part, investor-owned utilities that are regulated by a public utilities commission. Um, but uh, the, the, so you, you basically say, how much? what's your rate base? And then you assign a profit. Uh, you know, 8% or whatever it is on top of that rate base. And then you move into phase two, which is when you actually design the rates that the customers will face. Um, and then you just make sure that with the projected energy consumption, um, you cover all of those, uh, those revenue requirements, right? We actually have a, another uh, policy that goes beyond that, which actually gives the utilities an upside. It establishes energy efficiency goals for the utilities, and then it gives them an upside so their shareholders can actually make money if they exceed their energy efficiency targets. Uh, so decoupling is sort of the first step, and then this, uh, this efficiency upside is the second step. Uh, it's not without its, uh, its issues, so I certainly am happy to talk about it later. Uh, another question at the back there, please. Uh, Robert Lowe from uh, UCL Energy Institute. Uh, I wonder if the panelists could comment on the extent to which in their own jurisdictions uh, building regulation uh, is important to the safe conduct of energy efficiency retrofit. Good question. I'm going to start with you, Kayleigh, on that. Is retrofit, uh, building retrofit a large element of your current policy focus? Uh, absolutely. Thank you for the question. Um, it, it's obviously uh, front of mind for a lot of folks these days, uh, but for us in particular, we have a uh, commitment to net, near, net, zero, near, net zero energy ready codes by 2022 for both retrofits and new builds. Um, and that is something that we're developing model codes at the federal level for provinces and territories to adopt accordingly, underpinned by strong regulations and, and, uh, and adoption at the, at the level because we are shared jurisdiction. Um, and this is also 
being supported directly by the link to technology by investments in R D and D, so the research, uh, the research development and uh, and uh, demonstration projects to actually test the validity of the codes, to demonstrate the new technologies, to make them commercially viable, and to make them the de-risking of adoption, but also to make it uh, for us in Canada in particular, a lot of uh, efficient building materials have to come over from Europe in some circumstances, and so for us, it's also having a domestic market in place to make the adoption of those codes that much easier. Thank you. Jim, uh, just to turn back to a point we were discussing earlier where you were talking about the, uh, all these great opportunities that digitalization and connectivity uh, is, is, is opening up, which I think no one would disagree with. But there is quite a bit of policy dependence there in terms of people able to deploy these technologies, everything from security and privacy issues to even just creating markets for what they're able to sell. Um, so do you feel that there's an issue here, which I think we, we, one or two others have alluded to, is there a risk that policymakers are behind the curve? Is there a question of regulation and market design being ready for this kind of the pace of innovation that's happening? I think it's a challenge for everyone to keep up with the pace of innovation that's happening. I mean, whether it's the private sector or policymakers, that's, that is the ongoing challenge is how do we set appropriate guardrails from a policy perspective that both allow this level of innovation to continue to happen, um, but at the same time ensure that it's, it's happening in a responsible way that, that moves us all toward the same target. And, you know, Brian, you mentioned security. I think that's a, that's a critical component we all need to be focusing on is, is right now the, the market for IoT devices, the market for connected devices out there, um, to use a colloquial, it's, it's, it's the Wild West. And what we're seeing is, is that both perceived and real um, security challenges around these connected devices that whether it's connected to your, your home internet or whether it's connected to your business and your infrastructure, um, they're just, there's not a lot of focus in that space right now. And you know, there is focus in that space from companies like ours who are, who are driven to protect their customers' data and security, but the manufacturers of all these devices, um, they're just putting them on the market and, and, and trying to build that, that market share for those products. And then often seeing what was, what's happening is, is they would correct in hindsight or they would discover, discover issues or we would discover issues uh, that we'd have to correct midstream and, and be able to address security breaches or potential security breaches. And the big concern really is that, is that we don't see an overreaction from a policy front um, to these perceived and real data breaches and security breaches and, and security issues that we see from IoT devices. So I think it's, it's up to us in the industry to take the responsibility to ensure that as we deploy these new technologies onto the market that the level of security is, is paramount but also equal to the level of innovation in that space. And there's absolutely, as you mentioned earlier, room for, for policy to address that issue to create a level playing field but also to create some baselines that we all need to live by. Fatty, if I could come back to you, because we're talking there about digital technologies and things that have hardly been invented yet, but of course, there's a lot of what I'll call old-fashioned technologies that are so crucial to energy use and energy efficiency, and one I wanted to bring in was motors, uh, because, you know, half the world's energy is involved in motor systems in one way or the other, and from manufacturing to your devices, this must be a key, a key issue for you. Yeah, I'm, uh, thank you, uh, Brian. The, um, this is uh, really very important, uh, the, the, the topic. The industrial electric motors um, uh, are responsible uh, roughly uh, the 40-45% uh, of the global electricity use. Uh, thus, uh, the uh, market transformation on the electric motors uh, are uh, extremely important. Uh, the, uh, the market transformation uh, towards the energy efficient uh, electric motors is uh, a great importance uh, to reduce the uh, overall uh, carbon uh, emissions um, and uh, to, to meet uh, the uh, countries, uh, the uh, intended um, uh, national uh, determined uh, the, uh, contribution. The collecting the old and inefficient uh, electric motors um, uh, and of course uh, the uh, uh, recycling uh, them uh, because we have to use the uh, uh, secondary usage uh, of the uh, electric uh, motor, and uh, the replacing with them uh, the uh, uh, new uh, ones, the efficient uh, ones, uh, requires to properly uh, establish the financial mechanism for the uh, industry. 
In this context, uh, the uh, incentivizing uh, the most uh, energy efficient motors helps the scale up the uh, transformation. Uh, in many countries, try to do uh, their best, but the uh, PPPs, uh, I mean the partner uh, uh, private uh, partnership, uh, are uh, very important uh, for uh, the uh, conversion of the um, uh, electric motor uh, industry. The state policy policies uh, the must include uh, the uh, setting up uh, the uh, effective and enforcing uh, the uh, market surveillance uh, the activities because uh, unfortunately uh, the uh, uncontrolled uh, and uh, the uh, free runners uh, may jeopardize uh, the uh, positive uh, outcome of the energy efficiency uh, uh, policies for the electric motors the, in addition to this uh, the uh, the technology on the uh, electric motors are very important. I mean, uh, we we have to uh, pass uh, the uh, conventional induction motor uh, to uh, brushless DC motor for any kind of uh, the uh, industry. Okay. Thank you very much. Let's go back to the floor. Proud. Yes, thank you. Rod Jansen from Energy and Demand. I would like to ask a question to Mr. Oskari as well. I know you've just talked, but you mentioned you have 18 factories and you're going to have a 19th one. I have actually visited the dishwasher factory in uh, Ankara where you, I think, produce 10% of the world's dishwashers in that one building, uh, which is quite impressive. Uh, and the reason why I was there is that we were actually doing training for ESCOs in Turkey, and we used your factory, so you, you, had a, you provided a very good place for us to do it. What I'm wondering about is how do you ensure sort of the general performance in all of your 18 buildings? What sort of, what sort of policies do you have internally inside your company to actually, or do you have them compete against each other so that there's a benchmarks? How do you, how do you maintain some sort of improving the quality. I know the quality of the product. The dishwasher itself is done under Echo Design. So those standards are set. But I'm talking about the quality in terms of your own energy consumption. How, how is that handled in Archilic? Okay, thank you. So Fatih, about not the devices, but your manufacturing sites, your industries, how do you drive energy efficiency? The, uh, I mean, the, uh, the, the first, uh, I think the R&D is uh, the very important. Uh, just uh, uh, let me give you one example. Um, uh, it was 1997, we decided to develop our own uh, the uh, vacuum insulation technology uh, for our uh, the products. And uh, it passed uh, roughly the 15 uh, years, uh, then uh, developing their own uh, technology. Uh, uh, it helped uh, to uh, reduce uh, the energy consumption of the uh, 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 products. And uh, the, another uh, example uh, is coming from the R&D side uh, is the uh, variable speed drive uh, compressors uh, for uh, reducing uh, the uh, extremely uh, reducing the energy consumption of the refrigerators. But to do this, the uh, communication between uh, the uh, stakeholders, uh, like the uh, ministries uh, of industry, ministries of the energy, are also very important uh, to, to get the uh, policy, policies. Um, uh, if I don't remember wrongly, the, uh, it was the 1995, uh, it was the, the first energy labeling in uh, Europe. And uh, for the first uh, phase of the energy uh, labeling uh, uh, to uh, Turkey, it passed seven uh, years. Uh, I think uh, it, it took a, 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 a long way. And so, uh, but the second phase, uh, we uh, closely work with the ministries uh, uh, of the industry and uh, the uh, energy, uh, and uh, we were in line uh, with the uh, European uh, uh, Union countries uh, to pass the uh, new energy efficiency uh, labeling. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So just really quickly, you know, I want to build on Rod's question because benchmarking is a word that hasn't come up very much today, uh, and. 
Uh, we're in the process of implementing a statewide uh, non-residential and multifamily benchmarking program that uh, in the middle of next year is going to start uh, requiring uh, benchmarking of all buildings essentially above 50,000 square feet in California. And a year after that requirement kicks in, we're actually going to publicly disclose the benchmark information. And we're hopeful that that's going to drive the marketplace. And um, so California's done it, the first state in the US, but a bunch of cities have done it. And, and I'm sure other folks in the room have programs of some sort. But a benchmarking and having a public component to it seems like it's a really great way to drive markets. Okay. Um, I, I think the point is really important, and to, and to build on Andrew's comment, um, we're also looking at ways to, we have voluntary labeling uh, as of now and, and looking with provinces and territories to develop a, a more mandatory approach, but also how to share and disclose data in a way to move away from the shaming approach as opposed to an educational approach, to leverage it looking at it by postal code or by block disclosure, doing heat mapping of energy usage to really drive that. And digital tools, this is where that technology intersection is perfect, you know, really leveraging. We have an app that we use to, to incent education and, and awareness change in Canadians, um, as well as, you know, you then see that potential of an IoT environment, as Jim was speaking about, to not only um, really under, you know, you can manage energy consumption, as someone spoke about earlier today, to, but to also understand it and then make policy that reflects the true patterns of consumption. And the more we can approach data sharing and disclosure, I think that advances our efforts significantly. Thanks. Sarah, and then Jim. No, I just want to, I, I completely agree with Andrew, and in fact, uh, we have, uh, we've taken up a very large program for public buildings, and we've recently launched a website where, uh, and I'll pass on that, that uh, website through this app that we have. Uh, presently, the 25 buildings in the country, the data is populated, it's all public, so wherever we have worked. But by the end of the year, 2,500 buildings will be populated on that. So. Essentially, it'll 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 tell uh, the 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 uh, uh, let's say two states as to why in a particular state and uh, a similar building is consuming more than mine, and also it's a public disclosure, uh, a proactive public disclosure. So that also would would uh, probably uh, let others, uh, both public and private buildings, to come into this whole fold. So this has already been done. I'll pass on the 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 link uh, to everyone for uh, to have a look. And to build on Rod's comments, I would. Uh, I would remind us to never forget the power of competition. Uh, and when we talk about disclosure and when we talk about opportunities, uh, the most traditional sense of competition is obviously business versus business. And, and companies that we compete with in this space of energy efficiency, not just from a cost reduction standpoint, but really from an ability to drive new business and new customers to, to us is, is critical. Um, so everything from that approach to even individual homeowners, I, I recall when my utility started sending us within our utility bill every month um, a comparison of my home versus my neighbor's home, and I think that started in California actually, and, and um, nothing drove me and my wife more to reduce our energy load than knowing that we had a larger energy footprint in our neighbor right next door. So um, <laughs> let's, let us never forget the opportunities that we can create around competition whether it be between individuals or people on social media who are competing in many ways or individual businesses. Thank you. Sarah, I did want to go back to you because you spoke at the start about um, the importance of policy leading to, to things happening. But of course, uh, ESL has this incredible distinction in the energy efficiency world of having no subsidies because energy efficiency does have a certain reputation for being uh, subsidy oriented. So. Uh, have you proven that subsidies are never required, or uh, do, would you still see there's a place for the spending of public money? Or what are your thoughts on that? Well, uh, first of all, subsidy, according to me, should not be used for energy efficiency for, for two reasons. Number one, there is a limited amount of subsidy available, whether it is a, a government or a, or a multilateral. B, the moment you blend subsidy in energy efficiency, then you limit the size of the market. I mean, we, we would have never reached uh, maybe one-tenth of what we have reached if we had asked for subsidy from uh, anywhere. Having said that, what is needed is, uh, the, yes, there is a lot of support needed from public money. One, of course, is institutional development, which is extremely important. And, and let me say, when we started the program four years ago, uh, the... the KFW gave us a line of credit, topped it up with a, with, a, with a technical assistance which helped us strengthen the institution, B, create projects which we can 
take it to, to, to a financial institution for, for uh, and then capacity development of stakeholders. So these three, four critical things are there where I still feel public money needs to be used, but definitely not on subsidy, whether it comes from the ratepayers or it comes from any other uh, government or uh, multilaterals. Kelly, in, in your forward-looking work, how much do you think you'll, you'll move forward and meet your targets using what I'll call conventional policy instruments, more of them, so more subsidies, more regulation, more labelling, or do you think you're going to be thinking about very new kind of instruments? Because Andrew was talking a bit about the need for new thinking. Where are you on that? It's a really important question, and I don't pretend to have the perfect answer here, but where, first of all, where there are um, going to be direct either contribution programs or, or that will be, they'll be developed in a way that is not top down, but rather partnership and bottom up so that they actually respond to the needs. So in where, where traditional methods are used, I would say that. But also in terms of when we look at regulation, it's no longer about strictly forcing the market into a direction, but rather working with the market to ensure market transformation strategies. And that's really where we've been focusing in the area of equipment um, and seeing really profound returns, working directly with industry stakeholders to work on a market transformation agenda as opposed to just saying, thou shalt do this by this date, but to try and anticipate where the innovators are identify them, work with them, and regulate accordingly. And so that's part of where I think will be a big area of success in the near term. Can I ask a similar question to you, Andrew, because you raised it again. You have really aggressive targets that are kind of beyond the norm. Do you think, we heard earlier, I think it was from Ulrich from Germany saying, look, he doesn't think the technologies exist uh, to meet the targets. Do you think the policy instruments exist to meet your targets? Yeah, I actually think technology is not our problem. I think it's, uh, it's scale. Um, and markets have to do that. I mean, I agree. You know, we subsidize relatively liberally, but uh, even so, there's nowhere near the, you know, the capital in the public coffers to, to, to get to where we need to go. So private capital has to come to the table. We've got a few mechanisms that are working, you know, property assessed clean energy and things like that. Uh, that, that is enabling clean energy portfolios of projects to go up to the capital markets and do placements that are in the $300, $400 million range, which is, you know, you're talking about real money then. Um, but um, I, I guess, again, I, I often come back to the data problem. Um, I think, you know, benchmarking, part of the reason I think the benchmarking program is going to be so uh, key is that the first thing the law that, that asked us to do this benchmarking did was say the utilities shall give the building owner the whole building energy consumption effectively and easily. And uh, solving that problem was probably bigger than the actual benchmarking program itself. You know, we have to be able to see the consumption patterns, do baselining, a few people mentioned that this morning, do baselining, and then have a disaggregated data set that enables us to look at, at that enables us to understand what's working and what's not working on a local uh, and a temporal basis. And then we can go and say, okay, well, we know this part of the built environment is going to be, has, all the, has a lot of opportunities, or this particular place where there's a load constraint, there's transmission constraints, is really where we ought to focus, and th there's a lot of potential there. Those, the ability to inform policy uh, is a kind of a collateral benefit of, of uh, giving customers what they want and need already. So I think there's a lot of synergy there uh, in getting our data house in order. And you know, we, 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 we're the home to Silicon Valley. <laughs> we can do this. This actually, it's a big data problem, but it's not, uh, it's not, a, it's not the biggest data problem in the world. Um, and so this is actually a solvable problem. I think how we need to get out of our own way is really has to do more with the legacy monopoly regulatory approach and and that just hasn't it hasn't moved forward quickly enough and so we've got to modernize that and then we'll be able to take advantage of all the technology that already exists and is still to come and in that regard because the question came up earlier around decoupling of, of, of profits from energy sales but the classic utility is a 100-year-old beast that knows about selling more energy to make more money. So it's not just a question of policy shift. There's quite a bit of culture change to be done there, too. Yeah, I mean, that's probably a subject of a, like a whole-day um, conference. But 
but that's absolutely right. And you know, the utilities uh, are, you know, all the utilities, all utilities across the world are probably struggling in one way or another with this. Um, but you know, the, the edges of the grid are no longer a monopoly. They no longer have the monopoly characteristics that they used to have. So the poles and wires probably still do mostly, right? So I don't think the business model of the utility is fundamentally at risk. <laughs> but there are lots of innovative businesses and people and uh, services that are being offered to customers that happen to use energy. And so we have to think about that broader environment and then appreciate, obviously, the energy piece of it. Um, but the, that the customers make decisions for any you know, myriad reasons, and, and they almost never have primarily to do with energy. And so I think that, that edge of the grid is we have to, we have to as policymakers, understand and, and use that to our advantage. Um, Andrew mentioned the role of capital there. We've just posted a question on the app, uh, a poll about the role of capital and energy efficiency, and we'll report back on that in our finance discussion later on. So do please vote on that uh, during the break at the end of this session. Uh, we've time for one or two more questions from the floor in this session. Hand at the back there. I'm Sergio Gariba from Italy. I'd like to thank the panel. I have a question. Don't you think that uh, I, information communication technology will be the major driver in the future to technology evolution? And uh, our players, I mean, should be, of course, we have here Microsoft, but Yahoo, Uber, Google. I mean, we will have the social networks, and uh, social networks will be a major means in order, I mean, to improve energy efficiency. So we have to look at that and how, I say, the new information communication technology might help in our respect. Don't you think that? Thank you. Thank you. Who'd like to comment on that? Jim. I could start. Yeah. So I think two of the primary drivers are going to be, as I, as I mentioned earlier, um, connected devices and the ability that connected devices to, that have to dramatically increase energy efficiency in everything from dishwashers and appliances to the edge of the grid, as Andrew mentioned, um, that information flow is going to be critical to really taking us leaps forward when we talk about efficiency of, of the, the, I would say the legacy infrastructure we have today, but also new infrastructure and the ability for people to have visibility to that data in meaningful ways across different social media channels, we're providing that. The analytics are critical though, and I, also, I mentioned this in my, in my opening, that the challenge of all these connected devices is just the massive amounts of data that they provide, and currently the challenge is at, at managing that data in a meaningful way to make meaningful decisions is, is something we're already facing. And the, the exponential growth of just data, data, data is, is really starting to stretch the industry a bit. But again, again we're, it's creating an opportunity for the industry, uh, such as the services that, that we and other cloud service providers offer, uh, to provide the analytical tools to analyze that data and, and make policy recommendations or make investment recommendations to capital investors and others. So I think that's, that's really going to be critical, is those connected devices. And then I would say, uh, when we talk about the grid, and Andrew, I'm glad you brought up the, the, the edge, because that's really where you're starting to see a number of large players in the space um, tinker with innovation in, in new meaningful ways when we talk about when we talk about distributed energy models, when we talk about using IoT devices to really control um, grid distribution and new models of grid in a, in a very meaningful way. That's exciting stuff. And I, I'll just quickly share an example where uh, when we build a data center, uh, we essentially have to build two backup systems associated with that. One is a big bank of batteries that provides energy in case the grid goes down uh, instantaneously, and the other is a large set of generators, um, traditionally powered by diesel, but mostly switching to gas turbines these days, that um, that provide long-term energy stability if the, if the grid goes down. And in in the state of Wyoming, in the United States, we we actually. We're expanding one of our data centers in that space, and the utility said, "Wow, you're going to you're going to double the demand on on our grid uh, by just opening this one data center." And we we're able to negotiate with this utility in a very meaningful way that 
we let them use our, our gas turbine generators as, as their base load versus forcing them to build yet more capital and more infrastructure into that space. So I think that's just one example where you're starting to see this distributed model work in very meaningful ways that both produce efficiency and in capital investments, but also produce a much more stable and effective grid across multiple distribution channels. And frankly, new revenue streams that we never even thought of because part of this opportunity and part of the solution we created with this utility in the U.S. was we got much lower rates associated with that for our, for our energy coming into that data center, and they were able to pass on lower rates to their consumers because, they, again, they didn't have to make that capital investment in, in new generation technology and new generation capacity within their grid. So I, I would say those are the two big issues that you're, or two big opportunities you're going to see from a technology standpoint. Andy. Thank you. Um, I think there's massive opportunities, but with massive opportunity also comes challenges. Um, as we said, you know, really, uh, truly being able to understand the consumer, understanding habits, patterns, really being able to understand energy usage and the shifting nature of demand uh, will enable us to be, you know, my team is called the Demand Policy and Analysis Division within the OEE. So to be able to truly understand the demand side of the equation, ICTs will, will offer a huge uh, gateway tool, uh, the better data we can can have, the more we can analyze the data and actually play around with it and truly understand the, the hidden patterns will offer us some, some really important insights as we develop policy moving forward. Um, there are a few challenges as well that come up in, a, in an ICT digital fueled era. Uh, a couple of the things that have really, when you think about how empowered the consumer is, they're, they're, they're calling it the rise of the prosumer now, where the consumer ends up, you know, they, they own the marketplace and not vice versa. Uh, and if you think of the prosumer from an energy point of view who can produce their own energy, uh, disconnect from the grid, they can 3D print their own parts to a product that used to be an Energy Star certified product, but is it still, once you've modified it with a 3D printed dongle, for example, um, you know, these are the things that we're trying to understand. We don't have the answers, but we are asking ourselves the question and working with stakeholders to better identify some of those areas as well, so that we can at least, if these are perhaps not regulatory or policy issues, but areas we need to take into account moving forward. Andrew, briefly. So, yeah, so very briefly. Um, so, I mean, obviously, I think the answer to your question is yes. Um, but uh, I just wanted to give a quick example of, of this. So, uh, we have so we have zero net energy goals in California that that are uh, you know, broad policy goals. But obviously, the building code is a key piece of them. And we're in the middle of updating our 2019 building code, and we're going to get very close to, to, to a mandatory zero net energy in the resident, single family residential. Uh, so we're making really good progress there. Um, on the commercial side, we have some incredible innovation going on. Um, we have low rise, uh, both retrofit, uh, you know, rehab and new construction commercial that are kind of, uh, they, they help me think about this and they help me kind of illustrate it. So uh, when you're, let's say you're, uh, you know, working in a, in a commercial space and you're, you're showing up to work um, and you've got your phone in your pocket, you know, we're all, we all have our real time trackers now, right? And you get near the building, and the building knows you're coming. And it sets your office to the right temperature, and it turns the lights to the right level. If you're a lawyer, it says, OK, you need X number of lumens on the, on the surface. OK, it dims your, maybe you've got you know, photochromatic windows. It dims those if you have direct lighting and things. OK, so that's great. That, that, the reason you love that space is because it's a beautiful space, and it's awesome, right? And you, you work effectively, and you're, you're, you're productive. Um, so then when you go to a meeting, um, you leave that room. It knows you've left that room, and it saves some energy. It turns off the HVAC to that room. It, dim it turns off the lights. It, f it fixes everything to sort of save some energy. But those two things don't have to go together. Beautiful buildings that are very functional don't have to be the most energy efficient buildings. And so our challenge with policy is to make sure that those, th those two things go together uh, so that we have standards in place for the communications with the grid, between the grid and that building, between the grid and that office, for example, so that demand response can get in there and reach in when it needs to and, and generate value that way instead of having to require all of these redundant investments, you know, because those are not the social optimal from a policy perspective. So I think uh, the, the buildings that, so people are, are excited about those buildings because they have low vacancy rates, because they can charge higher rents, because their employees are more productive. All of those value streams, those cash flows, and those are tangible cash flows, those dwarf anything related to energy. But they also serve our needs as energy policymakers. So, so that's, I think, where we're going, is, is better products that also have positive energy characteristics. And it's all enabled by this ICT you know, uh, development. Uh, lawyers don't need lumens in their office. They're allergic to daylight. It's what kills them, I think. 
Um, I'm going to squeeze in one more question here, then we'll have to close. Yes, hi. Hi, my name is Tom Dreesen. I'm U.S., but I'm living in Asia for five years. I'm a hardcore energy efficiency ESCO guy. I've been doing it for 35 years. I know, Andrew, we've been go back a long time. But I, I was at an energy uh, power conference uh, in, in Manila, 2017, about three weeks ago. And I was struck by the, the, the realization by these utilities, this is all the utilities, of the duck curve that's happening. I mean, everybody, they didn't mind solar and renewable as long as it was a small business. But now it's a big business, and it's taken out all the main, the, during the, the peak times, and they've got tremendous, they view tremendous stranded assets coming ahead of them, big time. And they were talking about the result of that may very well be fixed charges no matter what, which has a huge negative impact on energy efficiency if, if end users cannot realize the savings. If they've got, I mean, they're, they're talking about rates going up significantly. So I, one question on that is, is how do you feel, what policies do you think can come in place to offset that, I mean, in the future? Do you not see that uh, as a big problem? But a second one, which they didn't talk about, which scared me a lot, was I, 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 was, I was an ESCO owned by a utility. And if you understand utilities, their mindset is real men build power plants, okay? And they, they want scale all the time. And it felt like in this conference they woke the, the sleeping lion. They're the last ones in. And now they're saying, oh, we got to go out and build a lot of solar now. So my concern was they're going to go out and just build much more than is needed, just ignore the energy efficiency. They have no interest in energy efficiency because that reduces the scale of the power plants. So I guess I'm just wondering, those two issues kind of got me alarmed a little bit about energy efficiency in the long run. And if there's, if any of you have experience on that or whether you feel there's some policies that out there that can offset that, would be very interested to hear your perspective. Thank you for that. Sarah, let me start with you, because in a growing energy system, this debate about how much of the solution is, is building more supply or how much is energy efficiency, and a lot of countries, as the questioner rightly said, tend to think about supply first. What's the debate in India about this? No, I mean, India being a, a, a kind of a, a, an economy which is growing, so the debate is actually not much on, on whether we need to increase supply. Yes, we do need to increase supply. But yes, there have been significant renewable energy and energy efficiency gains. But having said that, I mean, uh, just to answer your question about, about utilities not really interested in energy efficiency, so what, what the Bureau of Energy Efficiency, which is the statutory body, did was that it, it, it made sure that these demand side management plans, action plans are prepared for almost all utilities. And what is happening across the country, across utilities, is that there's a major gap between peak and off-peak, and you rightly mentioned, uh, for example, in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the state cap, in the capital of the country where I come from, the difference is as much as 40 percent. Now, during, during those off-peak hours, I, I as a utility, I'm, I'm actually burning a hole in my pocket because I'm, I'm paying the fixed charge and I'm not able to do anything with the, with the, with the. so therefore, demand side management and energy efficiency and what uh, Andrew talked about demand responses. These are actually now coming, uh, not just about about uh, it is not just about uh, the scale of uh, or reducing your scale of operations, but it is about financial viability of the of the utility. Number two, we have uh, on the issue of renewables and how, how, yes, there are two kinds of programs that are going on in India. One, of course, is uh, megawatt scale uh, solar, uh, solar and wind parks. But we've also started recently decentralized solar in terms of rooftops, in terms of going near to the user and, and, and creating those, uh, the, the, these, uh, these things, for example, solar agriculture pumps which actually are going to improve the health of the, of the utility from the financial perspective, from the, from the servicing perspective, and from a long-term perspective. So I think it's a, it's a combination of all which is right now happening uh, in the Indian market. Okay, colleagues, I'm afraid we have to cut it there. We could discuss a lot more on this topic and many others, but time won't allow. So I'm going to ask the panelists to stay with me on the stage while we hear from our next special speaker. But before I introduce him, could we please have a round of applause for our excellent panelists? Please.
So thank you very much. We have a special business address now from a special guest from China, Dr. Wu Daohang. He may not be a household name in Europe yet, but I think that's probably only a matter of time because he's a very well-known figure in business and in technology in China. Uh, he's the chair and founder of the Shenwu Group of many companies, which we'll hear about in a minute. And he's also the, uh, the chairman of the National China Energy Conservation Association, which is the national body for ESCOs, which, as you know, China has the largest ESCO sector in the world and uh, Dr. Wu is chairman of the overall Umbrella Association. So we'll need our headsets for this if you don't speak uh, Chinese. But please welcome to the stage Dr. Wu Daohan. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to and also experience and practices in uh, clean production in China. So personally, I'm the director of ISCO Committee of China, and I'm also chairman of the board Shenwu Technology Group Corporation. I'm a founder of Shenwu Corporation. Today, I would like to deliver five thoughts. First, on behalf of ISCO presidents in China, I'd like to present policies in terms of energy efficiency and some achievements. Chinese government has launched uh, the strategy of focusing on energy efficiency with energy conservation being a mean of uh, economic structuring and environmental uh, protection. The Chinese government paid a lot of attention to energy efficiency and environment protection. And the Chinese government has taken a holistic approach with uh, legal, administrative, and economic means. For legislation, we have uh, uh, implemented a lot of laws during 11th and 12th February plan. For administration uh, means, uh, the government also set up some fiscal and financial measures to promote energy efficiency action. China has already achieved a lot of accomplishments uh, driven by policies. Over the last decade, China's energy consumption per unit of GDP has been declined by 37.4%, equivalent to uh, saving 1.8 billion standard coal. And over the last two, uh, two, uh, two years, uh, Chinese annual average consumption growth rate has been declined, while the annual average GDP growth reaches 9.3%. Uh, and World Bank study indicates that like, China's energy saving accounts for more than half of the global total energy saving in the world. So China is becoming an uh, energy efficiency champion in the world. And of course, ESCO industry has contributed a lot to these achievements. By the end of last year, the ESCO industry had a total return uh, turnover of 52 billion US dollars. The investments contracted and the EPC model amounted to 100 uh, billion US dollars, so which saved a uh, standard co of around 360 billion. So China is becoming the biggest ice coal market in the world, and the ice coal industry uh, has around 5,008 ice coal companies, uh, providing 650,000 uh, 50, uh, job opportunities across China, providing uh, services in the fields of industry, construction, transport and infrastructure. So concerning business models, uh, we use very f uh, commonly share savings, guarantee savings, uh, a mixed model, and some other innovative business model as well, such as BOT, BT, etc. 
we are carrying out uh, international exchanges activities as well, and we have uh, exchange program with you at Germany, and especially social cooperation. And in the framework of Belt One Belt One Road framework, we have also cooperation activities. Uh, all these activities aim to promote energy efficiency experience uh, in China. So the second point concerns Chinese uh, energy situation. So as you all know, uh, China is a coal-rich country, but we like oil and natural gas. And the import uh, rate of oil reaches already 6%, and 35% of natural gas is imported. And investment in energy is very high, and China will still rely on mainly coal. And and you can see here, and coal fair power plants contribute a lot to air pollution in China. So that's why China is covered by smog very often. And also, it contributes negatively to greenhouse gas emissions. But what is a positive is like China's uh, coal fair power plants have improved significantly uh, efficiency level. And our Premier Minister Li Keqiang called already for upgrading of coal fair power plant generation uh, with ultra low emissions and efficiency technologies by the end of 2020. So China will be the country with the most, the highest efficiency technologies in the power uh, plant sector. So we are going to uh, replace uh, coal consumption uh, with higher efficient technologies. So our company is specialized in providing this kind of technologies. On behalf of the founder of Shen Wu Company, I would like to present a little about our company. Uh, Shen Wu was founded in 1966, and now we are the largest ESCO company in China. And we strive to provide energy saving and low carbon technologies. And also, we are dedicated to R&D activities in the area of industrial energy saving and emission reduction activities. And we have failed major technology areas. And we have also 2,004 patents and two national engineering research centers, and also two listed companies. Two other uh, companies are preparing their uh, listing process as well. And our turnover was um, 6.7 uh, billion US dollars last year. And now I'd like to present some activities uh, of our company in China. So nobody really like coal, but everybody uh, need to rely on it. So how can we do that? We need to use more coal, but cannot produce any more pollution. Now, a silent revolution of fossil fuel is emerging in China. Now I'd like to uh, present a little bit four technologies uh, provided by Shen Wu Company. So no matter where we have coal power plants, we can produce oil and natural gas. So everyone understands that coal is used for thermal power generation, but we can also use coal uh, to produce oil and natural gas while producing uh, electricity. So this is the first technology. And for the second technology, we can substitute coal for coal and electricity as raw materials in ferrous and non-ferrous metal smelting process. And this will improve the 
feasibility of uh, manufacturing activities. And we can also produce large amount of oil, natural gas, and downstream high-end chemical products. And for the last technology, we can also treat municipal uh, wastes, biomass, sludge, and organic wastes, which can be used to produce oil, natural gas, charcoal, and other organic fertilizer at a lower cost. So these are four technologies like Shen Wu are providing so far. So let's look at closer uh, detail into the first technology. So we can use coal to produce uh, natural gas and oil. The technology looks simple, so we call it rapid parallelized, quick uh, rapid parallelized. It only needs six seconds to produce uh, 20 and 30 percent uh, natural gas and oil. So if we make a simple calculate, uh, if we treat uh, all coal consumed in China for thermal power generation, we can produce 140 million tons of oil and 200 billion cubic meters of natural gas. So the natural gas production uh, is a excuse me. So this is equivalent to the total natural gas consumption in China. And for the second technology, we can replace coal. We can replace coke and electricity by coal in ferrous and nefarious metal uh, manufacturing activity. And you can see this is traditional uh, furnace process, and which is quite pollutant. And this is the area in manufacturing process, uh, which uses Shenwu technology. So we can use a low-grade uh, coke uh, to uh, produce uh, iron. And we can also use coal to produce hydrogen. And, and, electric, and, and the efficiency level can be increased by uh, 20%. So to be simple, Shen Wu uh, company uh, uses these three technologies to to produce mining uh, products and improve energy efficiency and also reduce uh, manufacturing cost. So all these are projects undergoing in China. And for the third technology, we use coal to produce coal and the limestone on to produce oil and natural gas. And we are promoting two technologies which are which are generating significant results. Now the prices uh, of natural gas and oil are falling, so uh, the project uh, have not generated a significant benefit so far. Uh, we have also some uh, other um, negative uh, effects. For example, for coal and chemical industry, uh, investment is very large, but uh, efficient level is low, so the profitability is poor. So you can see here, uh, the right line means coal and the blue line means uh, uh, volatile, volatile matter. So we use uh, coal and at so we don't think gasification process is the most uh, sound technology to treat uh, coal. So we use actinine method to produce uh, hydrogen and uh, so this process is more uh, clean, it's cleaner and uh, economically available. So you can see here, when we compare gasification to uh, activity method, uh, investment is reduced significantly, energy efficiency is improved by 15%, water consumption is lower, and 
we can generate electricity with limestone or so it's a totally new concept so we have many projects ongoing so far for example we have 18 billion US dollars uh, projects in China and all these projects can generate uh, annual benefits of uh, 1.7 billion US dollars and for the last technologies, we are all familiar with uh, municipal waste, biomass, large, and other organic waste. Generally, we incinerate these uh, wastes to produce energy, but uh, we can also use it more efficiently. And uh, biomass use now is only uh, around 20%, but we can use it more efficiently at a level of 80%. So in the world, we uh, and we have uh, gasification uh, and other technologies to treat uh, municipal waste, but now we use parallel technology to treat uh, municipal waste. Now we are promoting this technology across China quickly. So in my opinion, and we are innovating our concept of using coal now in the world with new technologies. We do not only use coal for energy generation, but we use it also as the raw material for other products manufacturing. So it's not only a dirty fuel, it's, on, it's also a resource. If we use it as a raw material, it will not generate so much pollution. So that's why I would like to say we need to use more coal, but burn less coal. For biomass and other municipal uh, wastes, we can also use them to produce oil, natural gas, and other organic fertilizer. And we can not only use uh, traditional fossil fuels, we can also use these kind of biomass sources to produce other fuels. So uh, finally, I would like to, to say uh, we hope Chen Wu's technology not only play a role in China, but also can help the world's uh, energy transition. And we also welcome uh, IEA colleagues and ministers from all the countries to visit China and our company. And also I would like to uh, further discuss with IEA to establish a special organization uh, in terms of clean and efficient use of coal and organic wastes. And this would extend the key mission of IEA and OECD countries. So you all know the name of Sh uh, Alibaba uh, and other companies, but I, in the future I hope you know Shen Wu company as well. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Wu. A couple of weeks ago in Beijing, I got to visit Dr. Wu's uh, operations, and I can tell you they're very impressive in terms of the range of technological innovation going on. And I think it's very interesting to hear that mix of technology innovation, but also business model innovation. And I think also for a lot of us, a, a different take on the place of coal in the future energy debate and, and some of the, the opportunities that technology creates. So we very much appreciate your contribution, Dr. Wu. And this is a good moment actually to also thank our interpreters for both French and Chinese who have been doing a very good job for us during the day. So ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a, a coffee break now. And when we return, we will be discussing energy efficiency finance. So thank you very much.